All right. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is April Shepherd, and welcome to Lily's Show and Tell series. Lily stands for Lifelong Information Literacy, and we are a group of librarians and library staff and information professionals who work to promote lifelong information literacy learning. If you want to know more about Lily or to join, or if you have an idea for a presentation, I have my email up in my Zoom name. You can just shoot me an email. And before we begin, I just have a couple of housekeeping items. First, please keep your mic on mute unless you are speaking. Two, let's make sure we're respectful of each other. And then three, uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat. I'll keep an eye on it. That way Matthew doesn't have to, and I'll make sure to write down anything um, and we'll try to get to everything at the end. And then finally, I just wanna thank the Lilly Web Committee. They're the ones who put together this series and it's been absolutely excellent this, um, this year. And to our speaker, welcome back, Matthew. Matthew Chase is a librarian at the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences. At the university, Matthew manages the San Marcos Campus Library, providing instructional services and research consultations to students, staff, and faculty. He coordinates digital exhibits, health and wellness services for the university community, and workshops on inclusive and intersectional research practices. So thank you for coming back, Matthew. Thank you so much, April. Uh, yeah, this this series has been really great, and I'm I'm really happy to be back, kind of doing a, a part two, almost a, a follow up to uh, the previous session I did on Mozilla Hubs. And uh, with that, let me share my screen so you can actually see my uh, my slides here. Let's see. Let's put it here. Okay. I think you should be able to see it. Um, but yeah, um, I'm sorry, what was that? Yes, we can see it. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. I never know sometimes, like it's it's hard to tell with, uh, with Zoom and all, but, uh, but yeah, so this is uh, just basically titled The Metaverse Librarian. Apologies for the kind of clickbaity title, but I kind of liked it, honestly. It was giving me kind of Masters of the Universe vibes. Um, but yeah, essentially, uh, as the subtitle of the of the session is building 3D virtual reality learning environments with Mozilla spoke. Um, and as I alluded to before, this is kind of a follow up from uh, the previous session I did with Lily uh, regarding uh, Mozilla hubs, which I'll kind of give a, a brief um, uh, explanation for those who didn't attend that session don't really know what I'm talking about when I'm referring to Mozilla hubs. Uh, or even for those who did attend and maybe just uh, kind of need a refresher, which is totally fine. Uh, but yeah, so with that, though, let me move on to my uh, next slide here. Uh, before I get into the the meat of the whole uh, session, I uh, just wanted to kind of briefly introduce myself. I think April did an excellent job on, <laughs> on introducing me. But yeah, just to kind of reaffirm, uh, my name is Matthew Chase. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a librarian at the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences. Uh, which is primarily a graduate school. So we, uh, it's a degree offering for master uh, programs as well as doctoral, uh, centered around health sciences. So uh, for the most part, the uh, fields of science that we kind of focus on are like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language, uh, speech language pathology and nursing, as well as a, a few other programs as well. And uh, it's kind of a, we're kind of a hybrid when it comes to um, uh, programs where you do on campus programs, uh, residential ones, but we also do um, uh, online, completely online post professional type of uh, programs as well. So for me, a lot of my uh, job is kind of balancing between the two, uh, helping students and supporting students uh, with their research and other types of uh, uh, needs. Uh, when it comes to both on campus as well as the virtual. So uh, yeah, so for me, when I came across Mozilla Hubs and Mozilla Spoke, it really kind of addressed that kind of need uh, for me to meet the virtual uh, experiences, the learning experiences of our students, especially for as a lot of us probably <laughs> are definitely experienced in some capacity or form with the pandemic. And so um, for me, identifying Mozilla Spoke and Mozilla Hubs as a uh, useful tool, uh, as a kind of an alternative to like Zoom and other types of uh, virtual uh, tools that we've used to kind of create learning spaces of sorts in our classrooms and even beyond that uh, has been really helpful. 
I think I did also in my last session, but I do want to give credit again to the one who actually introduced me to Mozilla Hubs and spoke, uh, Rosa, uh, Rosa Rodriguez, who is an outreach coordinator at the California State University of San Marcos. Uh, yeah, without them, I would not have been uh, necessarily exposed to Mozilla Spoke and Mozilla Hubs and really got into it myself and really learning how to, uh, how to really maximize its uh, utility. So thank you. So with that, we'll go on to our next slide here. So yeah, for today's agenda with the session, I'm, I'm going to provide a very quick refresher on Mozilla Hubs. I'm not really going to focus on it too much. Uh, at least on that side of things, just mainly because I've already done the session there. So if you want to watch the recording for that, feel free. Or you can always contact me personally. I'm more than happy to uh, to uh, talk about it. Uh, I love this type of tool, so go for it. But really what I'm going to talk about instead is Mozilla Spoke, which is basically uh, the, the background or the, the behind the scenes of Mozilla Hubs in terms of how you can actually design uh, the learning environments within Mozilla Hubs and really have a lot more creative uh, control over what is uh, incorporated there. Uh, and then I'm going to do kind of a, a, demo, a, a demo on how to create a basic scene using Mozilla Spoke. And then uh, also I didn't put it in the agenda here, but I will feature also a fully fleshed out uh, scene that I've, I've done uh, in terms of my own instructional use. Uh, Particularly if you've attended the last session, it would be the uh, the labyrinth uh, scene that I've created. Uh, but yeah, we'll get into that as well. And then also for Q and A, uh, thank you, April, for tracking down any any uh, comments that come in through the chat. More than happy to have a conversation uh, regarding anything I could clarify or uh, any other uses that we can kind of think about for for Mozilla Spoke and Mozilla Hubs. So with that. As a, as a quick refresher, essentially Mozilla Hubs is an open source platform to create fully customizable and interactive virtual 3D spaces. Uh, those spaces can actually be accessed uh, through your web browser, through uh, mobile devices, and even VR headsets. So it's a predominantly web-based uh, tool uh, that you can that you can use. Like for example, uh, for me, I mostly use a, a laptop or a computer of some sort to access it. But you can definitely do uh, mobile devices like phones, uh, tablets, anything like that, and even VR headsets. I believe most VR headsets are supported, such as like Oculus and, and so on. And, and Vive would be another one. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a really uh, useful tool. And because it's open source, uh, essentially, it's, it's free to access for, for anyone who has an internet connection. Um, and even the login system, it's completely optional at one point um, on one end, but it's also uh, on the other end, uh, very simple, <laughs> basically to create a, an account with Mozilla Hubs and Mozilla Spoke simply requires your email. Don't even have to create a password or anything like that. Essentially, once you uh, log in, uh, you just uh, submit your email for ver verification. It'll send a verification email to yourself. And then you just kind of verify on that end and you're pretty much logged in at that point. Um, and because like you might be wondering, well, if it's not creating a, a password or anything like that, is it a temporary account? No, it's actually one that uh, you can continue using. Once it verifies your email, you can continue using that same email to access the same account. So. And one of the things I actually wanted to point out is that uh, for me, at least, I'm actually inside Mozilla Hubs right now when I'm doing this presentation. So in this case, let's see. There we go. Perfect. So as you can see, uh, I'm actually in a, a sort of a conference room. Uh, and I have a presentation here that I kind of incorporated. But uh, yeah, and even like a, uh, a 360 image background that you can kind of see that I kind of just found off the internet that's uh, fortunately public domain. And uh, yeah, so basically I kind of created this really quick. It probably took me about maybe 30 minutes to an hour just to kind of get all the little uh, kinks out of it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was really simple to, to make. Um, uh, essentially. So this is an example of Mozilla Hubs, uh, where you can actually interact with different uh, components of it, in particular with like even the presentation, as you saw, I can uh, easily 
uh, change to different slides and so on. Uh, if I press the space bar, I get a few more options about like cloning the uh, document if I wanted to. Uh, let's see where. But but uh, but yeah, and so you can even take a picture of it and all that kind of stuff. Open links if there is any. This particular one doesn't. But uh, but yeah, it's a really cool type of tool. And uh, even though I just created a conference room, you can really create anything. You can create an entire classroom if you wanted to. You can create a conference hall uh, completely. You can create outdoors. It doesn't have to be inside a building per se. It could be like a full, uh, like there's been examples I've seen where people just create like a full on fair <laughs> of sorts. So you can do a whole lot of different types of environments depending on what you're wanting to do, uh, which can be really great for like simulations or anything like that as well. Uh, but yeah, so I wasn't really going to go into too much about the actual settings of, uh, of um, Mozilla Hubs. Really, what I want to talk about is Mozilla Spoke, because for the most part, you can place additional items, like you can place GIFs, you can place 3D models and other scenes inside here. But the thing is, when you actually go through Mozilla Hubs, uh, even though it does uh, give you that you know, creative freedom to actually add more stuff, you really can't do more the the fine tune editing of this room. Essentially, I can't remove this table. I can't move it. I can't do it with this chair either. Uh, I can't change out the uh, image outside or anything like that. Uh, essentially, what you'll want to do instead is access it through Mozilla Spoke, which is essentially, as I have a, a slide here, handy and waiting. It's essentially an online 3D scene editor and developer tool that allows you to design interactive virtual reality environments for Mozilla Hubs. Essentially, it's, it's kind of like, like I said, a behind the scenes type of tool uh, that allows you to have a lot more um, creative and uh, customizable options. Essentially, what I could do is essentially remove this entire room. I could change it into different uh, ways. I can add new things to it. And, uh, and so on. And so I'm actually gonna go into that uh, pretty much uh, right now. So I'm gonna move out of here. Also, uh, as a reference, if you do want access to this room, for the time being, I do really want people to get too distracted with this room uh, while I was talking about other stuff. Uh, I can definitely provide a link to the, to the room uh, afterwards. So I'm more than happy to do that. So, but yeah. So essentially, I'm just going to go to uh, Mozilla Hubs, the main website. Uh, so yeah, it's just hubs.mozilla.com. And this is essentially where you would be able to uh, create a room uh, similar to the one I did. Um, but it would be uh, pre-established rooms, essentially. So if I were to do this as an example, like it's just going to create a new room for me. Um, Again, I would have some control where I can add new things to that room, but I can't really delete things. I can't really move things that were already pre-established in that room before I got there. I can only move the stuff that I actually added in uh, after I was entering the room. But like I said, I couldn't, I couldn't necessarily move the table that was already there before I got there or anything like that. Uh, that would be through the spoken. And I know a lot of people in the past session had that question. So that's where we kind of came up with this particular session. Uh, so to actually access the spoke tool instead, what you're going to do is on the upper kind of left hand side here, there's a spoke option. I'm going to click on that. And essentially, this is where you can enter it. It will want you to log in, uh, mainly because you're going to create projects that it eventually wants to save. And if you don't uh, have an account, it's essentially going to not really be able to save them. <laughs> so basically, there should be a login screen uh, or option right on the upper right. Uh, like I said, the login um, for Mozilla Hubs is exactly the same as Mozilla Spoke. So whatever email you use to log in with Mozilla Hubs, you can just use that same email uh, to do the same. That's what I have here. That's why I just automatically logged me in under my, uh, my work email. And uh, yeah, there's a couple different uh, different uh, updates and other things that you can chase down about Spoke. But really what we're going to uh, look into is the getting started aspect. So we're going to get started here. This kind of shows all the uh, projects that I currently have uh, in the works. You might see a couple that are more like uh, wellness informed type of projects that I have in mind. Uh, eventually, I'm going to launch out a um, 
digital exhibit form. So uh, currently I did launch a digital exhibit series at my, uh, my institution, uh, but it's mainly a static, uh, you know, just web, uh, website-based type of platform. And I thought like Mozilla Hubs might be a really great avenue to host more interactive spaces for exhibits. Uh, but it hasn't been launched yet, so I won't, I won't get into that yet. It still has its own little uh, flaws that I need to, uh, to finesse, but easy enough to, to launch eventually. Uh, we'll also kind of feature the Cognitive Bias Labyrinth that is the uh, fully fleshed out instruction uh, tool that I actually created or, or space. Uh, I can highlight that in a minute. Uh, this is the conference room that I actually just uh, showed you all, uh, basically, uh, so you can actually edit it, or you can even create a whole new project. Uh, I'm going to just uh, say, like, create a new project for the time being, just kind of show what it looks like. So when you start out a new project, you have a couple different options, or not, it's really more than a couple. Uh, essentially, you could uh, create a new empty project where it has nothing really there uh, in, in that space, and you can kind of just build as you go. Or you also have the option to use any of the rooms that have been um, uh, acknowledged as being uh, remixable. Essentially, the whoever created the particular room allowed it to be remixed so you could actually use it uh, for your own purposes, which is actually really useful, especially if you already have a, a pre-established room that kind of meets your, your, uh, your needs and you just want to make some uh, adjustments to it, which has been really useful. I do, the, I do that a lot on my own as well. Because sometimes it's kind of daunting to just kind of start out with an, with an empty project. But I'm going to just show that for, for this purpose. So once you actually do create an empty room, uh, essentially, uh, it just creates this very basic uh, uh, layout. Uh, essentially, it has some mountains. It has uh, a... ...fallen at uh, with this particular figure here. And you can create more of them. You can adjust where they're going to. You can even move it uh, later if you if you find need for that. Uh, also, with the grid, this kind of like white lines and grids here. Uh, this is basically the floor plan, and it essentially just shows where people can actually walk or move in some fashion or form. Um, usually, for me, I don't really find much need to actually adjust the floor plan. I kind of just use this as kind of like the the default. Uh, but you can definitely move it if you do plan on being like a higher level of some sort. Maybe there's like multiple stories in your in your house. But honestly, even if that's the case, I usually just kind of leave it to this. And uh, I really don't have to mess with it too much. Same with the spawn point, unless, again, you kind of you have a specific place you want it to be. Um, but yeah, so basically I'm using the uh, like kind of the scroll wheel on uh, my mouse to kind of zoom in and then zoom out. Um, and then if you want to like move around or anything like that, that is kind of the trickiest thing. This is the one thing I kind of have a, um, a criticism when it comes to spoke is the movement system. So in hubs, it's pretty easy. You kind of use the WASD keys or the arrow keys and you can move forward. You can strafe left or right, all that kind of stuff. With spoke, it's a little bit more, um, uh, I guess, complicated in a way. Essentially, you can do the whole zooming in, zooming out. Uh, you can also, if you uh, press and hold the, the left click button on your, on your mouse and drag it, you can basically kind of move around like this. Um, but it's kind of limited when you do that because essentially you're kind of still fixed on one particular point that it's looking at. Um, and you can actually change that depending on what item you're looking at. So say uh, I was like interested in like, the, um, Let's see the terrain here. So it's kind of highlighting this. And I press the F button. Essentially, it'll reorient me to where I can look at the item uh, that I'm kind of focusing on or that I clicked on or highlighted. Uh, that way I can kind of zoom in a little closer to it. Or maybe it was that um, spawn point that I was more interested in and wanted to take a closer look at that. I press F again, it'll reorient me uh pretty pretty close next to the item that i that i clicked on uh if that kind of if that kind of makes sense uh, there is another way you could do about this uh that uh is useful is where you can have a little bit more of a, a fly mode where it kind of allows you to have a little bit more uh control basically if you press and hold the right click on your uh on your mouse and just hold on to it 
and then kind of drag around, you can actually get a better kind of like uh, look at your different environments here. And if you uh, continue uh, clicking on uh, the right click button and then holding onto it, you can actually use the WASD keys uh, to move around. So you can almost kind of like fly essentially. And you can even clip through if you need to, or you know, get back out of that. Um, but yeah, and then if you need to go a little faster, you find that's a little slow for you. If you uh, click and hold onto the right click, as well as uh, hold onto the shift button, and then uh, use the WASD keys, you can zoom in a little faster. Uh, again, like I said, it's <laughs> it's the only criticism I have about it, where it can kind of get a little bit. Um, I guess frustrating at times when you're trying to get a little bit better view of something, but honestly, it's kind of a small criticism. Uh, that's pretty much the only criticism I usually have when I'm actually using spoke in that regard. So it takes a little getting used to. For me, it did for sure. So I totally understand if you're if you're having to uh, do that. Uh, but yeah, so to kind of get a little bit uh, deeper into what exactly are all these different features, because there's a lot to, to, to uh, kind of cover. And I'll just kind of introduce them to you. Honestly, for me, like even with Spoke, I'm kind of learning new things as I'm, as I'm going. Like I'm finding new features that I didn't even realize existed. Um, so yeah, so feel free to, to experiment and explore. But I'll give you a kind of a, a good orientation of what everything kind of does in some capacity or form. Uh, so yeah, so the viewport is essentially your kind of view of the entire uh, 3D setting that you're creating. Uh, so this is where you can actually interact with different objects. You can highlight as it shows with that blue line because I clicked on the uh, landscape, which is essentially identified as the terrain creator one. It's basically just a default uh, object it creates. Um, and again, you can even click on the, uh, the figure, the, the spawn point uh, as it were and look at that, anything like that. But uh, so yeah, this is kind of giving you a, 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 a 3D look at what your world is kind of coming to be. Then on the right-hand side here uh, with the hierarchy uh, panel, uh, which is shown here, I kind of already have alluded to it in a couple different ways, mainly in the sense that it's providing or displaying all the objects that currently exist uh, within this world. There's a, a few default ones that just kind of come with any particular world. One is being the skybox. This is essentially pretty much the, the sky <laughs> as, as it is. Um, and then we also have some directional light. I really don't mess with the directional light all that often, but you feel free if you want to. Uh, but there are some settings that I can show a little bit. Uh, then the spawn point, which is basically that little figure that you saw at the at the bottom there, uh, and that's basically again uh, where your uh, avatar would spawn in if you if this world was published through hubs and people can access it. Uh, and then the floor plan again, I don't really mess with it, but essentially it's just representing the 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 movement area that uh, that avatars can kind of navigate around. Um, and then we also have, again, the terrain, which is just kind of like a default terrain that gets created, but you can easily uh, remove it or uh, you know, reshape it a little bit uh, to, to fit your needs. I, I typically kind of get rid of it because eventually I don't really need mountains <laughs> for the most part. Usually I'm using like conference rooms or other types of, other types of environments, uh, but yeah. So on the bottom here, this is where the uh, properties um, uh, panel exists. And essentially, each of these items has a different uh, properties panel. Uh, depending on what it is, it will have different settings. Uh, some of them are pretty shared or are very similar. But uh, for the most part, yeah, there might be some uh, little differences depending on what the item uh, is that you're, that you're currently selecting. So for example, I selected the terrain. And it shows me a bunch of different properties about uh, this particular object. Uh, and this is where with hubs, you can't really get that like finesse with like where you place things. Like you can probably generate an item, but it kind of gets a little hard trying to navigate like where you want that chair to be. Uh, this is a lot more exact because you get that whole grid scenario and it gives you a lot more uh, specificity with where uh, it is in, in this grid. Uh, so say with this with this mountain in particular, and I find that I kind of want to move it a bit uh, uh, for my purposes. 
Uh, essentially, you can either uh, generate a number here. You can just press in a number from your keyboard. Uh, or you can use the arrow keys, like the up and down, to kind of like increase or decrease the value. So with like, say, the X here, I can actually move it. And it's actually moving slightly more towards the, towards the right. And if I'm finding that's a little, like it's only in small increments and I need a larger a number, I can easily get a little bit more drastic with it. So say I want to highlight all this and press in 50. And move the, the uh, particular uh, object uh, a lot towards the, towards the right. I can go even further with like 100 or 10, you know, as, as I want to go. Uh, the Y is usually just referring to the height of it. So if I want it to go a little higher, I can definitely do that. Uh, so I'm going to put in a random number in here, let's say 100. So you can see it just jumped up. Um, and that's totally fine too, uh, where people can still spawn up there with that, uh, with that uh, particular you know, uh, mountain range and stuff like that. So it really doesn't affect too much in terms of like access to it. But say you spawn, you want your, uh, your, your uh, any users to spawn down here, they wouldn't be able to access this. Uh, so you'll have to probably create a spawn point somewhere up there instead. But, uh, but yeah, uh, but I'm just gonna put it back down towards the, towards the ground. It, usually the default for the floor plan is zero. So I, I just put it at zero. That way it's a lot more accessible. And yeah, there's a bunch of other like uh, features here. You can do rotations. Uh, for me, a really easy rotation uh, trick actually with, uh, with any object. Say you wanted to kind of like rotate towards uh, the right or the left or something like that, because uh, it's not facing the right way. You can actually either use the rotation uh, options here, uh, which you can, or you can actually press E on, on your keyboard. So the E key. And it actually shifts it, uh, just rotates it 90 degrees every so often. So, but yeah, or I'm sorry, 45 degrees. I should I should uh, should specify there. So yeah, so I'm able to as I click on it, it's rotating it uh, every so often. So, but yeah, so there's that. Um, and then yeah, there's a couple other uh, you know uh, properties because this is a 3D model. This is the options that are provided. Uh, there's a model, U a model URL, which you typically don't have to use a whole lot. Honestly, I wouldn't really mess with it because if you do, this uh, model will probably either a break or it will just remove, its, uh, remove itself entirely. Uh, sometimes some models have a loop animation. This particular one doesn't. Um, there's also uh, collidable, walkable. Essentially, this is just saying like if you checkbox the collidable, it means that if a person tries to go up against it, they won't be able to like phase through it. Uh, they will collide into it. Uh, walkable is essentially just meaning that they can actually walk on uh, this particular area. So even with all these like bumps and everything like that, like you know the ridges and everything like that, they can still walk up, uh, you know, up the up the peak, uh, as it were. Uh, cat shadows, receive shadows, stuff like that. A lot of this stuff I don't really mess with a whole too much, depending on again your use. Uh, but yeah, they're definitely there. So it does give you a lot of uh, creativity in that in that sense. You can also rename this. So say you, for organization purposes, as you're kind of working with this hierarchy panel, you want to call this like I don't know, mountains. So that way it's a little bit more clear to you what this object is referring to. You can immediately get it renamed like that. Uh, you can also make it visible or uh, not visible and stuff like that. Enabled seems to kind of just do the same thing. I don't really know much of why there's a difference. I've never actually seen any of the documentation specify a difference between these two, uh, but it's there. Um, so if you were wanting to make this uh, not visible at all, I probably would just uh, uncheck box these both, or if you want to make it visible, I would check box both of them. Uh, but yeah, so there's a couple different settings you can see with floor plans There's settings there. Again, I don't really mess with them. I usually find the default settings are exactly what I want anyway. Uh, you can do the spawn point. So again, because I moved the, the mountain here, uh, the spawn point was left behind over here. So if I want to move it over there, I can. There's a couple different ways I can do that. Either again, I can do the position uh, numbers here, the, uh, the inputs. Or another really useful way to move an object without having to try to guess where it is in the, in the position is just pressing the G uh, uh, key on your keyboard. So if I uh, press it, essentially now with my cursor, I'm able to move the object wherever I need it to be. 
Uh, so essentially, I can move it over, uh, say, there. And I just uh, click the uh, left click button, and it essentially locates it there uh, at this point. You don't really have to, oh, actually, it zoomed all the way here. So that you do have to be careful with that. Sometimes even if you're pointing over there, it'll, it'll put it somewhere else that you didn't really intend. But it's easy enough just to grab it again with the G and maybe uh, zoom in a little closer to where you need to be. So I think because, yeah, if it's probably farther away looking like that, it probably just means I'm, I'm actually locating it exactly where I need it to be. So, but yeah, so uh, it takes a little kind of getting used to. Again, it's probably my one criticism is a little bit of the movements at times with, uh, with yourself as the viewer. Uh, but if you get used to it, like I have been getting uh, more and more used to it and kind of accepting of, of this, um, it's, it's not too bad, honestly. Uh, but yeah, so there's a bunch of other options here. There's Skybox. There's actually been a question, I believe, in the last session about uh, using 3D uh, images and using that as to create a, a setting or some sort of ambience that kind of brands it with maybe your campus or with whatever uh, uh, institution or other place that you kind of want it to represent. Definitely can do that. It won't be through the skybox. I actually looked at the documentation just to make sure I was correct on this. It's uh, you don't replace the skybox here uh, with it. Instead, you're going to insert an image, which I can which I can show uh, actually uh, uh, shortly. But yeah, if you ever want to adjust certain settings about the about the area about or about the skybox, you can make it a brighter, you can make it darker, so you can make it almost like an evening type of situation or, or night. Uh, or middle of the day type of thing. So you can do a whole bunch of other uh, settings on that on that option. So uh, with that, um, I'm actually going to go to the bottom here, which is probably the place that I use probably the most out of all these uh, panels is the assets panel and the elements panel. Or actually, it's really just assets. Uh, elements is just referring to these certain tabs, which I'll get into. Uh, I'm going to scroll this up. That way you can kind of see it a lot better. Uh, but yeah, essentially the assets um, uh, panel is where you can actually uh, generate objects for the, your environment, whatever it's going to be. Uh, there's a couple different options to be provided to you. Uh, the default uh, tab here is the elements tab. So essentially you can input uh, certain um, objects here, such as like a spawn point. So again, if you had another place that you want people to spawn at, you can click on this and you can, uh, you know, uh, locate it somewhere. As you can kind of see with my cursor there, there's like a blue highlighted silhouette. That's a spawn point and I can actually just locate it anywhere I want here. And uh, yeah, so now it's located there. So now I have two spawn points, as you can see in the hierarchy uh, panel on the right here. There's one here and then there's one here. So. Uh, so anything you're going to add to the world is going to be included in this hierarchy. So that way it's a little bit easier for you to find it later on because maybe you're creating a very huge world or a very kind of just complicated world and uh, you're having a hard time finding a certain object and making sure it's either deleted or, or adjusted in some manner. Uh, some other really cool ones, you can actually add water effects as well. So say I, I wanted some water coming down here, I can actually do that. I'm actually going to see if I can locate it really quick. So yeah, you can create like that. Honestly, for this, is it's a very flat type of uh, water uh, feature. So probably what would be best is if I had located this water feature somewhere closer to the ground. And, uh, and I can even make it bigger. So I can actually make the scale of this particular object much uh, larger than it is. So I can make it 50 times as big and flood the entire ridge there. So there's a couple of different options you can go with. As you can see, you can even change the color of the water. You can change the uh, tide, like in terms of like you know the uh, the uh, the tide and and the, and the surf <laughs> of of the water, and such like that. Uh, if you ever do want to delete an object, you find that maybe I don't want this water. Uh, all you have to do is uh, click on that object as it's kind of highlighted here, and you can see that blue highlight around the object and press the backspace button or the delete button. Essentially gets rid of it. It's pretty easy on that end. So even if you create something that you're like, I'm not really liking this, you can totally do that. Um, but yeah, and there's a bunch of other uh, images and videos, which I'll get into. These are just creating kind of like a site where the, where the image would be, but it doesn't actually uh, populate it yet. Um, 
uh, but I can show how that kind of works. I, or I can show you an easier way of, of making that work. Um, you can create links. So you can actually um, uh, link it to a website or something like that, which I, I do in a couple of my uh, environments where I uh, have it to where they can link to a particular website that I'm referring to in the, in the environment of some sort, uh, a resource. It even says a hubs room you can actually link it to. Um, or uh, another way too is, uh, I know, I think there was a question about it in the last session is like take an attendance and such. And in the hubs uh, side of things, you really can't take attendance, but you could provide a link instead uh, to a uh, to a Google form or anything else like that to where people would have to kind of like, you, you can direct them like, hey, please use this link to, uh, to register your attendance to this event or classroom or anything like that. You can totally do that. Um, so if I were to create this and I put it like right here, for example, so maybe it's like located there, or maybe a lot of times I'll place it right against the wall or something like that for people to refer to. You can actually put in the link of the URL to that particular Google form or website or whatever you're going to use. It doesn't really matter. It will accept any uh, proper uh, link. So, but again, I'll just delete it for our purposes here. And a whole bunch of other ones. I haven't really like fully delved into every single one of these, but uh, the audio zone is actually really useful. Uh, this is like, because in, in the hubs room, uh, basically uh, audio is spatial. It depends on how close you are to whoever's speaking or how far away you are. It'll even go like in your uh, right ear or the left ear, kind of like a binaural uh, type of uh, situation, which is really useful. But sometimes you might have multiple like spaces within uh, your environment that you kind of don't want to hear the overlapping audio from a different uh, part of the, uh, of the environment. Say like, uh, say uh, you created a school and you had multiple classrooms within that school. Uh, you don't want to hear the overlapping uh, noise and audio from uh, one of the classrooms as you're trying to do a presentation in the other one, per se. Uh, one way to do that is creating an audio zone so where it can actually isolate the audio from one room uh, from another one so that people don't hear things unless they actually enter the other classroom within that environment, if that kind of that makes sense. But yeah, there's a lot of great stuff on here. Uh, another really great one is media frames. So I'm going to go back to my hubs room really quick. Oh, I'm just going to refresh it really quick. That's totally fine. But essentially, you saw where I had the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, presentation, essentially. So I didn't actually put the PowerPoint in here uh, it, through spoke. I actually put it through hubs. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpin this and delete. And uh, I'm going to place it again really quick. Let's see. Do, do, do. Generate really quick. But uh, let's see. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> so it's going to generate this one more time. So as you can see, I can kind of move it. But as you saw, as I got closer to the screen here, it was highlighting in blue, and which is really useful because essentially as I get closer to it, I can actually like automatically like uh, lock it in to this presentation spot, uh, which is essentially called a media frame. And I can make the medium frame as big as I want or small as I want, but I can't put it in here through hubs. I actually have to go through spoke to place it in. And it's one of these options right here, a frame to capture media objects. And again, I can place it anywhere I want. I can make the scale of it as big as I want. So if you want a huge like movie theater style <laughs> type of screen, you can totally do that. And essentially whatever object you're gonna place in there, it's gonna uh, populate to that size. Um, so yeah, so you can totally do that on, on your end. Uh, but again, you can only do that through spoke. You can't insert a media frame through, uh, through hubs. Uh, you can only just uh, insert you know, PowerPoint presentations and so on. Uh, one of the important things too to note here is with the properties uh, panel here with, with this particular media frame, you can actually uh, make it to where it accepts only certain types of objects, maybe like 2D media, which probably would include PDFs and anything like that, or uh, flat uh, JPEGs or anything like that. 3D models you can actually do, which is pretty useful if, you, if you're doing for that purpose. Um, actually, funny enough, I, I was doing with uh, 
uh, a, a kid and he wanted like different models, like different like uh, toy models on, on the desk. And I kind of created it to where he can uh, keep replacing the models and, and put it on, the, on that desk that he has uh, through hubs. Um, or you can only uh, make it to where it accepts images. So JPEGs, PNGs, anything like that, or only videos. You can actually uh, have it to where it plays a certain video or only PDFs, which in this case would be my PowerPoint. So it doesn't accept uh, Microsoft documents like you know Word or PowerPoint or anything like that. You'll actually have to convert it into a PDF, uh, but that's a, that's a small, small adjustment. But uh, yeah, uh, I'll do a quick little preview of these and then I'll kind of open it up for any questions and stuff like too, or uh, have it to where we can kind of clarify anything because there's a whole lot to spoke honestly. So I was even doubtful I, I'd be able to cover everything in, in, uh, in an hour's time, but I think, I think I'm getting at a good pace here. Uh, so uh, at the tab point here uh, under assets panel, there's my assets. So these are any assets that I personally uploaded into Spoke uh, and for different projects and such. So it's creating kind of a library of different images or other types of files that I've kind of uh, incorporated uh, across all of my different projects. Um, so as an example of one would be kind of like the uh, panoramic or uh, 3D, uh, 360 images. And this is something I thought was kind of uh, uh, useful to talk about here. So I'm going to uh, create this image. So I've already clicked on it. It's already going to locate it somewhere. So I'm just going to place it right in the middle of this world. Actually, I guess I didn't, but let's see. I can easily locate it right there. There we go. So I can immediately adjust the, the scale of it, make it a little larger. I can even make it uh, go a little higher. So like that, or maybe make it adjustable like there place it anywhere I really want. But this is a flat three, uh, like a flat image of it. Um, but say I want to make it a, a skybox to where like the entire world is kind of like encompassed within this image, to kind of create a certain environment or feel. I can definitely do that in the properties panel right here. So if I scroll down, there's actually a projection option. And you can go from flat, which is the default option, to 360. And essentially, it creates this little bubble. And if you make it large enough, usually I'd say maybe 200, depending on the size of it, it actually encompasses wherever the uh, users are going to be in. So when they're kind of coming in, that's what they see. They kind of see all these like buildings or whatever it's going to be. Again, this is kind of just an image that I kind of generated, but you can easily use like an institutional image of your campus or anything like that, or your public library might be used, pretty useful on that too. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say that's pretty simple uh, on that end. And you don't have to worry about this whole bubble situation. You're only going to see that from spokes in. But when you're actually in the world, uh, like in the hubs world, you're not going to see that bubble. You're just going to see this, essentially, from like this kind of perspective. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. But I know someone was kind of curious about that. And, um, and unfortunately, with, uh, with hubs, uh, through the hubs end, you could try making it, but from what I've like, what I've tried, it hasn't been very successful, or it's kind of more difficult than it has to be. Like this is way simpler, just creating it myself uh, this way. Or say maybe I want to change the skybox to be this image in particular, so I could copy the URL and put the image URL here, and press enter, and it changes it changes it out which is pretty simple. Or again, you could easily just have deleted the previous image, like I've shown, like just doing the backspace and then just inserting this other panoramic and doing the same thing. There's a couple of different ways you could do about it. It's only because I've gotten more used to it that I've started doing more of the URL codes and stuff like that, but, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, and basically a lot of these images I've created either in Canva or other things, or even like Camtasia if I was doing a video. And then I just upload the file here. And it accepts like MP, MP4 files, MP3 files. So if you're doing audio files, um, JPEG, PDF, anything like that. Again, just not Microsoft uh, type, of, type of documents unless you convert them into PDF. Uh, but yeah, there's a few other things like the architecture. So these are like very basic building blocks, essentially. So you can almost do a, a Lego situation of creating your own building. As you saw with the, that conference room, that was completely constructed with me creating like windows and, and uh, walls and floors and all that kind of stuff. 
and you can easily just place them as, as needed. Uh, and there's a bunch of different options that you can choose from, platforms, windows, uh, trims, anything like that, pillars, rails. So you can, you can go so, so far with this. Uh, this is actually really recommended using the architecture kit when you're building a building or some other type of structure, mainly because these have already been uh, tried and tested uh, for VR headsets so they can process them a, a lot easier and stuff like that, rather than incorporating your own uh, custom made objects or anything like that, if you happen to have any. Uh, so yeah, I would definitely recommend these, especially if you're kind of just getting used to it. Uh, rock kits. Uh, so yeah, any, any short uh, shapes of rocks. Uh, Mozilla Spoke and Mozilla Hubs actually have a partnership with uh, which Sketchfab, which is a, another website where people create uh, 3D models. Uh, and all of these are available for you to actually incorporate. So if I wanted like a Pokemon in here, I totally could do that. <laughs> I can make it a, any size I want, any rotation I want, stuff like that. Um, you can even do uh, Bing images and Bing uh, videos. I would definitely keep in mind copyright issues because even though it might be available through Bing, may not necessarily be uh, uh, copy, uh, you know, copyright friendly <laughs> or copy for, uh, copyright friendly to, to use. Uh, that's why I create a lot of my own stuff, like in terms of images and whatnot. Uh, but luckily with the, any of the 3D models, they already have an attribution uh, um, uh, disclaimer and everything like that. And I believe that's all that is needed with Sketchfab, anything that gets uploaded to Sketchfab. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, so, uh, there's actually some sound packs or so some audio type of uh, uh, settings that you can put on there. If you want to create even more ambiance of like a cafe or something like that, um, some even like gifts and whatnot, so that's easily uh, attainable through here as well. Uh, I've actually done a, a, a way of using these in my own instruction as well, but uh, but yeah. So I think at this point, I'm just going to move over to the um, to one of my existing projects. Basically, a, the cognitive ba a bias labyrinth. But in the meantime, I'm actually free to take any questions or anything like that. If there's been any from the from the chat, yeah, yeah. we got a couple. Cool. Uh, what accessibility issues and solutions are there in the buildings and rooms and experiences? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Actually, I know there have been some work on that, and luckily because it is open source, it's constantly getting more uh, work on it um, as a platform. Uh, and there have been uh, some, definitely some criticism, especially with the spatial audio and, and, and so on. There have been some attempts at fixing that, such as like uh, the audio zones, like I've mentioned. Um, and I believe, um, and this is something I really need to look into, but uh, someone had actually created uh, captioning uh, through, through hubs, but I haven't figured that out yet. Um, so I'll, I'll need to look into that, but uh, I can definitely follow up if I, if I learn anything in that regard. But that was something I recently just came across that someone was able to come, uh, create captioning uh, for presentations and so on, which I was really surprised to see. Um, although they did invite that there were issues with the recording if you were recording that event, and then if you're already having overlapping uh, captioning from, uh, uh, say, Zoom or from... Um, uh, YouTube or anything like that, there were kind of issues with that because there would be competing captions in that regard. But uh, but yeah, I, I need to figure that out more for sure. But I know audio has been one of the issues uh, in that regard. And um, audio zones were definitely a solution that was uh, created, uh, I think, fairly recently when it came to that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there was other accessibility issues that I was aware of. But yeah, I, I know that was actually one of the things I've been looking into more recently, especially because uh, I think that is definitely an important uh, discussion, especially for uh, us uh, over here with the Health Sciences University, where we're actually uh, addressing disability and all that. that. That has been one of our main focuses. So hopefully that answers, though. I, I know there's been more and more uh, progress and work uh, done uh, through Mozilla's end on, on addressing those. Uh, any other any other questions? Can you do more than just create rooms? Um, let's see. I, I'm trying to think of what that question is really wanting to ask about. Um, like in terms of like the environment just being like solely just a room, like a conference room or something like that. Yeah, you definitely could. Um, there's been examples like that. Um, I can go back to projects really quick. 
And if I were to create like a new project, there's actually other examples of, of uh, different spaces that have been created. Some are much more open than others. So I'm going to say like, I don't know, let's, let's do this one. I actually kind of like this one a lot. Someone actually created like a full on island uh, type of scenario um, to where you can just navigate through like the streets and such. Um, but yeah, so you can create a whole bunch of other types of, of interactive worlds. And like this one's already been pre-established, but I can already start like modifying uh, parts of it uh, for myself. So maybe I don't like certain elements of it or I kind of want to make adjustments to where uh, things are located. I definitely can. But, uh, but yeah, I'm trying to think if there was anything else to that question, because like in terms of terms of rooms, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I would just say, yeah, you can create like outdoor experiences, indoor experiences, uh, a whole host of different, different options, really. It's kind of really up to you, like what exactly you need or what you want to create, for sure. Can you take a photo and put it into the 3D images? Uh, yeah. Oh, let, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think of what that what means. Uh, so if you take a photo and you actually like try to upload it into here kind of thing. Um, yeah. I mean, basically you can, you can take whatever photos you have. Uh, again, it accepts like PNGs, um, uh, JPEG, anything like that. And you can basically upload it. It'll go into your assets here and uh, you can basically insert anything and there's certain like uh, logos or anything else that you need to create you can definitely uh, do so and um, yeah in terms of it being like a 3d kind of point it usually tends to be either a flat type of uh, object as it kind of shows here um, or uh, again you can also just make it more of the 3d uh, 360 image as well so i could even make this one for example so are you aware of anyone who has used um, scope and hubs to build an escape room? Uh, that would be me, actually. <laughs> I would know myself. I've actually done that. Um, so I, actually, I can show that really quick. And that was actually something I was briefly going to showcase. Because you might be wondering, like, well, how, like, how am I going to use this in an instructional format? And uh, yeah, this would be basically an example. I did showcase this uh, earlier with the earlier session on uh, Mozilla Hubs. Uh, where you can actually navigate this. I believe we still have the, the link to that actually in, uh, with, uh, as well as the recording of it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I can definitely provide that again uh, for this uh, particular session. Uh, but yeah, so this was essentially a labyrinth that I created, kind of like an escape room, but you can honestly do any shape and, and form of a, an escape room. I just personally like a labyrinth. <laughs> so I kind of went with this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I even have like a starting point. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna showcase. Or like where people kind of spawn at, they get some instructions here on how to actually navigate the labyrinth. They have some directions on where they want to go. Um, as an example here, I'm going to show. So say like they encountered this particular route where they were given a choice between two different uh, answers, uh, depending on what the, the question was prompting them to, to talk about. In this case, it was about cognitive bias. If they chose wrong, I just kind of did like a funny, uh, kind of like a wrong answer type of situation with, with GIFs and just said like, please try again kind of thing or anything like that. And so they would know to go over perhaps on the, on the alternative routes uh, to, find, uh, to find the correct pathway. Ultimately ending up at the end here where there was cake <laughs> provided. So yeah, they essentially could do that. Um, you know, because I know we're at the uh, short, a uh, little at the end of the uh, time, I'm going to definitely answer any questions, but I just thought about it. Another really important aspect when you finally create your whole room, such as like this one, you're fully done, you want to make it accessible uh, as, a, as a room uh, for people to, to use and interact in. Essentially, at the upper right here, there's the publish the hubs option. And if you click on it, it basically generates like a, a project screenshot, which you don't really have to worry about. It just kind of generates one uh, for itself. Um, you can create a scene name for it and create your attribution even too. You can make it allowable for remixing if you want to. One of the things though I do want to highlight, uh, as it tries to export your scene, it's actually going to generate some information about uh, the, uh, the environment itself, like in terms of the performance check. 
Um, and so ideally, you kind of want all these to kind of follow the recommendations that they uh, provide here in terms of like 50,000 triangles. Uh, and mainly this is because they are recommendations for mobile devices. Mobile devices probably have the hardest time when it comes to navigating these environments. So I definitely recommend using either uh, a computer or some sort of laptop, which is definitely the preferred way, or uh, VR headsets. Phones can access it, but they may have a harder time kind of um, processing or buffering all the information that's available. Um, but yeah, for the most part, if you can keep it down to a low or medium, that's pretty good. I think there's a high thing uh, that I need to fix on this. It was something I saw earlier too. Uh, but there was like some large texture which shouldn't be existing anyway. Uh, and it'll probably go back down to a medium. But if you can keep everything around to a medium to low, it means your uh, environment's probably going to be fairly operable for, for most people, uh, especially as they join. Um, and then finally, when you're ready for that, uh, you can just publish the scene. And that way you can actually use it um, as, as a room. Um, but yeah, any, any other questions again? Sorry. <laughs> With hubs being open source, is there anyone you know using it or in the process of building a customized fork of hubs in an education setting? That's a good uh, question. I have heard things from um, from San Jose State University, I believe. Um, I'm not really like too informed on what exactly they're doing. I think it's kind of a new initiative for them. So, you know, I, uh, I don't really have a whole lot of information. It's kind of just something I've heard from a colleague. Uh, but other than that, I really haven't heard a whole lot from other librarians and such. This is why I was so excited to kind of share uh, this particular tool with everyone just to kind of, because it seemed like it wasn't um, fully used yet or really fully kind of aware among uh, most people. Even my own colleagues at my library, I had no idea about it, so. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So that was uh, that would be my answer to that question. We we did have a comment earlier from um, Dr. Valerie Hill about librarians at com communityvirtuallibrary.org have created oh. um, virtual library branches. So Very cool. I, yeah. I can make sure you get that link at the end. Yeah, I would I would totally love to to see what they were doing uh, with this and maybe get more inspired by it. Honestly, like I said, I keep I keep finding new things about this, finding new applications. Like I said, even beyond um, uh, just a simple like assessment tool like this, like that's a, a virtual uh, escape room. I'm also thinking about like digital exhibits uh, and talking about information literacy on that end. Just again, making it a little bit more interactive uh, for for our students or any of our community members. Okay. I have a question. This is sure. mine. Okay. Um, is the learning curve more technical or do you think it's more design based kind of visualizing how it works? Oh, man, that's that's a really good question. I would almost kind of say maybe maybe a combination of both, honestly. Uh, for me, this is like with hubs, it's kind of a lot easier to kind of get used to. It's a lot more kind of intuitive in that sense. Um, and I think it was meant to, right? Just because like it's supposed to be a user-friendly interface. Uh, with Spoke, yeah, it, it has a lot more like that design and technical heavy type of interface that I think only for people who are really kind of interested in really making the full use of these separate environments would be interested in. For me, um, in terms of the time it took me to kind of learn this, I probably would say, mm, it's kind of difficult, obviously, because like with other responsibilities and such, but uh, for this room, for example, it probably took me a good um, maybe two weeks just to kind of get everything kind of finessed out. And maybe it probably wouldn't have taken me that long because this is one of the very first projects I ever kind of explored. So I was also learning how to use spoken at the same time and kind of just self-learning as I was going along. But honestly, like once I kind of got used to it, it, it like the, the, the turnaround time to actually generate a project or, or create one has gotten very a lot shorter because now I have a better idea of what exactly I want to use it for and how I can kind of go about that. So hopefully that kind of answers that question. <laughs> Yeah. I think we got one last question if sure. we get time for it. Of course. Um, so this, you know, hubs does seem similar to other virtual spaces, even mm. kind of Minecraft. And there's some Minecrafting elements to it. Yeah. How is this different or better? Ooh, how is this different or better? Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think I think that same kind of question came up about like Second Life uh, in the earlier session and such like that. 
Um, I don't know if it's necessarily better. I just, I, I think it does provide an, another alternative for us to kind of explore because I think it does have certain features that might be um, more, a lot easier or in some ways and maybe a lot more technical in others. So maybe a Minecraft and other, uh, you know, other, uh, alternative platforms like Second Life might be more uh, useful on some ends, but yeah, I've, I've been trying to think about this question because honestly, even like if you look at any discussions online about like, you know, Second Life versus Mozilla Hubs or uh, Mozilla Hubs versus like Minecraft and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, they've been fairly comparable. Uh, so honestly, I think it's kind of up to you, like what exactly kind of fits your needs in, the, in that regard. Like if you're seeing stuff that's on here that really like um, fits the... Um, the needs you have in terms of as, a, as an educator or a librarian or a, another information professional of some sort. Um, yeah, definitely feel free to take a look at it. In other ways, maybe, yeah, uh, it would be more useful to use uh, Minecraft, which again, I guess Minecraft in its own way has a more demographic with younger um, uh, populations. Maybe with hubs, it would be a lot, it can be a lot more transferable for people who are uh, older, such as mine, like most of my, my most of my students are, are graduate students. So uh, I think they've taken a lot more liking to this particular platform, for example. So I, yeah, I think that it kind of just depends on your community de demographics as well as your own pedagogical instructional needs. So, but they're fairly comparable, I would say. All right, and we do have a question about Minecraft, you know, require money, you know, yeah. like a life requiring a download. So there's some of those issues too. That's true too, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was, um, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. I would say that's probably a, definitely a, a difference between all three of them. Cause yeah, like I said, with spoke and in hubs, the, the login is super simple. It just needs a email verification. So if, as long as you have an, an email address of some sort and internet connection, um, yeah, it's totally usable, um, in, in that way. All right. Well, we are out of time. Um, thank you, everyone who came. And I will be sending out a link to our recording. It will probably be Friday. Um, we're in Arkansas. We have an ice storm coming. So I don't know how my power situation is going to be. But I'll try to get out to everyone Friday. So thank you, Matthew. This was great. No, thank you so much for inviting me to this. I was, um, was really excited to kind of share this tool with everyone. And, and I did your um, Lambreth on mobile and it worked just fine. Oh, perfect. I, I, I made it through, I got the cake. <laughs> awesome, glad to hear it. <laughs> Thank you everyone.